First the speaker, which is uh, Violetta Militzer, and she's an astronomer at Leiden Observatory since 2020, and she's especially interested in uh, the uh, gas clouds around the supermassive black holes, and uh, she's going to be the first part of the talk of today. And uh, so let's just welcome Juliet. And although I think that's not the first thing. Once it goes past the event horizon, 
ways to test generalities is actually you look for black holes in the most extreme cases, right? The two things go hand in hand. We don't just want to know about black holes, we also want to know about the fact that black holes exist, which is also going to be the concept of next talk uh, by. And uh, yeah, so we really want to see if black holes exist. And so the questions we wanted to address are are black holes real? And can we observe them? You know, whether black holes are real or not, we could debate it until recently. We actually found that even now, you know, there's people you know, kind of subject this uh, topic to, to tests. Are they real? Can we observe them? And does general relativity hold? Is this still working around big bangs and the rest? Uh, this is from 1974. This is a, 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 a nice cartoon that uh, Al showed me, uh, or written in the 70s, or still in the 70s. So here's a couple of basic equations. How do we observe a black hole? I'm just going to explain a few uh, concepts that I'm going to go over a couple of times in the talk. So if you want to observe a black hole, you want to observe a big one in the sky, you want to get a massive one, okay? Because the radius is proportional to its mass. That's pretty straightforward. However, in the sky, the angular size, theta, of this black hole will depend on the distance. Right, if you have a tennis ball in your hand, it will be bigger to your eyes than if it's in the moon because it's further, much more small. So you want a big black hole when relatively nearby. Okay? So you have two types of black hole that you can observe. There's this ones that are stellar, you know, this, you know the mass, you know the size, you can estimate the angular size of the sky, and the supermassive ones. You can do the same calculation. And the conclusion is they're both big and However, there are two exceptions to this. What about the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy? It is not huge, but it's the closest one. So the stage there is a star. And the other extreme case is a black hole that's further and it's really, really, really big. And so it turns out that stage a star at the center of our galaxy and M87 in another galaxy are actually pretty similar size to our telescopes in the sky. Okay, so here are the numbers. You can crunch them, and you can get them. To observe them, you need a size telescope that can observe 50 micro second or less in the sky, or half that to resolve it. So that's your pixel that you want to you have in the sky. And then actually, we could go into the tennis ball uh, attribute. Okay, so. Where is this telescope that can observe 25 to 50 microseconds? So here's some basics about telescopes. The smallest size you can observe in the sky is proportional to the wavelength that you're observing, whatever you choose to observe, and the telescope size. That means the bigger your telescope, the smaller the size you can observe. That's why astronomers have really, really huge telescopes. Okay? So if you want to, say, obtain 25 microseconds, that's what by two. You can do it in visible light, that's nanometers, these are short waves, but you need a telescope that's about five kilometers, that's a third of light, and it's a pretty big telescope. If you do it in the radio, one millimeter, it's a similar frequency to be used for our own radios, for telephones, and mass communication. The waves are longer than nanometers, okay, and therefore you need a bigger telescope, 10,000 kilometers. That's the size of the Earth. Well, it actually turns out that it's easier to observe 10,000 kilometer telescope, and I'm going to show you how to make a telescope that big for you. So astronomers always invade big telescopes. Um, this is uh, some of them, you know, at some point they become too big to make, and you have to put them on the ground, and you can't move them anymore, otherwise they collapse. So these are some spherical te rated telescopes, and this is our SIBO. Years ago, but uh, it's the biggest you can make uh, at all. In a sense. Now there's an even bigger one in China, which is also on the moon. But it turns out that you can make even bigger telescopes without having them collapse using a very neat technique that was developed in the 70s. It won the Nobel Prize in 1974 first, and it's called interferometry. The technique we use is very long baseline interferometry, VLDI. I'm going to use this word again. And it turns out that, okay, the resolution 
solution that I showed you previously is lambda, it's the wavelength divided by the size of the telescope, but that size can be the same as two telescopes equivalent to two telescopes of two particles of the world. So if you put a telescope here, and you put a telescope here, it is a telescope is taken care of, clearly. And we use this trick for the of the eye. Okay, so you can put as many antennas as you want. We don't have that many, but they're all pretty good. But then they're not connected. So how do you combine the signal? And that, in order for that to be possible, they needed to create atomic clocks that were really accurate. So you can observe at the same time all the telescopes, and then you align the signal using these clocks. So there are atomic clocks, antennas all around the world. We record the signal on a tape, and we ship it with UPS to a central location. Have a supercomputer or Carly that can find all the signals and then some really complicated analysis afterward and the image comes out. And this works. And to be honest, this technique has been used since the 80s and 90s already. This is not new. It's the 70s, 80s, we made beautiful images. Imagine you are the black hole and you're looking at the Earth. Oh,
founded there at the time. It was really exciting. It's 50 dishes, and we, the work together to be equivalent to a 70 meter dish, state of the art dish. And so Amber really um, was thought to be the antenna that was needed to see the black hole. So this, uh, so this is where it's located in the south of Japan, on Long Beach and somewhere. And it just, so a group of scientists, uh, large enough, realized that they had to tell them and they had to get together and get resources together. And this is how the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration was formed. It's made up of more than 300 scientists by now in 19 countries. It's a very complex uh, project. Uh, it has a very, you know, uh, it's well, a very complex uh, internal structure. It's board management team and the director and the staff. Um, and the Science Council, etc. And I'm an assistant council. So it's really a complex, uh, uh, complex structure, and it's uh, you know very ambitious. And so the, 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 it was formed. The goal was to observe M87 Sagittarius, so it's not black holes. So these are the main targets in the millimeter region with the OPI and solving a lot of the issues. Because of course, having AMA was great, but having AMA was not the end of the story. Needed to find observations and use these observations. Okay, so the, the commission was in 2014, the first observations were in 2017. Uh, these are the first observations from the first image you saw in 2019. And eight telescopes participated. I'm going to show you the eight telescopes that participated. There's Iran, 13 meter telescope in Spain. There's Alma, of course, I already told you about. There's Apex, uh, which is close to. The LMT is also a really important antenna in Mexico. It's a 50 meter dish, it's another big one. The SMT in Arizona, SMA in Hawaii, and last but not least, the South Pole Telescope, which is the hardest to operate. Uh, this is some of the people that did observations in 2017. This is Alma, this is me, uh, this is also Hal Alma, and these are the people from the other groups uh, who took part in those observations. Okay, I'm going to show you how the image was made. This is a really nice animation. So you can have one big dish, which we have also. With Alma. <laughs> or you have interferometry. You can have lots of many, lots of smaller dishes that observe together. Okay. So you are the, you are the black hole here, and you are observing. You are observing. And as the time goes on. All these connections are made. And this is how it works. When you take antennas that are further apart, you take their signals and they will resolve finer structure. So this, this is bigger, this where you resolve is smaller, and you see the fine structure in the ring. When you take pairs of antennas that are closer in together, but not quite as close, you, you see more diffuse stuff. And then you see the real diffuse stuff. And in the end, you get this is a simulation point where you can see exactly the black hole. That's exactly what was done. So, this is the last ring I'm going to show. I'm going to take you to a tour that led us to the image of M87 in Egypt in 2010. So, we're going to take a trip to the We're not giving up yet, we're not finished. 
and maybe we can make our Related to the question that was asked before, but uh, would there be any way uh, for interferometry to combine signals that you take at a, w a moment and then six months later when the Earth is on the other side of the Sun and then take advantage of the size of the orbit? Would you be able to yeah, use that to make a very big base or does it have to be simultaneous observation? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, yeah you do. Okay. So, so you're asking whether we can do, you know, get a very long baseline by waiting for the Earth to go around the sun. That's right. But, but we can only measure interference better if we get simultaneous detection uh, at, two, at two different locations. So we would need to have two planet Earth moving around the sun if we wanted to do what you suggested. Even if you have exquisite time stamping, you cannot somehow correlate the signals. No. It's just like doing a slit experiment. You cannot do it with, with a, later, uh, a later version of the, of the signal. You have to do it with the actual waves that are produced at the same time. Yeah, I was, was wondering about what you said about the synchronization. How do you link up the stairs? So is there a long antenna cable that you have to lay? Or yeah, no, yeah, they're not laid. They are completely free. They are um, always connected, but they're all attached to atomic clocks. But the, where is that? Is that uh, it's inside the antenna. The each, the each, each, each side has a clock. But they still need to cross synchronize the clocks. Yeah, it's cross synchronized at correlation time. At correlation time, they know which signal came at what time, and then they line them up exactly, precisely, with a nice position. And it's like they were connected. Okay. Yeah. They correlate to them.